Hey, it's Chris Schmidt with the Average Joe Sports Show. Decisions, decisions for Dana. Uh, the only thing that Nebraska and Iowa fans can agree on as a former Iowan and now in Nebraska, I'm Gary Sharp, is Casey's. Is there a Casey playing on Friday night? <laughs> Hi, I'm Bill Dolman. I have the boldest prediction of the season coming up for Iowa and Nebraska. Yeah, it's Elijah Herbal here. Black Friday, Iowa City, what we think happens, final score predictions. We'll lock those in on our final in-season midweek edition of the Average Joe Sports Show. And here we go, episode 73 of the Average Joe Sports Show. Like and subscribe the uh, Average Joe Sports Show on YouTube. Search there or Spotify and iTunes. The Iron Horse back at it. Gary Sharp, Bill Goldman, Elijah Herbal, Chris Schmidt. Uh, Happy Turkey Day, fellas. A little bit early. That's a good word. Uh, Turkey, turkey, goo. Turkey, turkey, giggle. Something like that. (laughs) You want me to sing the the whole Adam Sandler song? Ah. Turkey for you, turkey for me. <laughs> yes. It's a, it's yes. A, it's a different feeling Thanksgiving week this week because of you don't have that impending doom of like, is Nebraska going to get to six on Black Friday? I feel like that's become tradition around here over the past couple of years is Nebraska's five and six, Black Friday looms, and you have that impending doom as you cook your turkey and make your green bean casserole. Like, are they going to do it? And then they don't. We don't have that this year, so it's a little different. Nope, it was uh, well played on the offensive side of things. 44 points against Whiskey, and uh, it's now on to uh, to Iowa. Elijah will be uh, right across from Kinnick on Black Friday. Looking forward to that. Uh, our two other partners here, Sharpie and Dolman, there's always room. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. You know what? It is kind of like, a, first of all, Thanksgiving will be a lot better around here. Because uh, you'll have, like, football to talk with politics, and the football will be good. Uh, (laughs) It's kind of a weird – I've been asked this a lot. You know, like, there's a lot of joy in Nebraska, and we can never do this again. Like, you can never celebrate getting to six like we have. Like, you you get – you're almost out of time, but let's never celebrate like this again because you can't go back. If you're Matt Rule, you can't go back. But isn't it it an odd, like – like two two major things are colliding. Nebraska's won six. People are happy. They're trying to decide on a bowl. And then, oh, by the way, you play Iowa. So are you satisfied at six and six? Would you be disappointed if they didn't win on Friday night? See what I'm getting at? It's like a weird balance of, man, this is awesome. I love Saturday night. Oh, God, what if they lose on Friday? Here's, here's the thing. If there have been great – teams like national championship caliber teams like at night and gotten blown out some Michigan squads for sure the urban Ohio state squad in 18 I think it was 8 17 or 18 so people have gone to Kinnick and died okay at, at night <laughs> uh, teams I should say <laughs> we'll keep it with teams <laughs> and uh there's no shame in, in not getting out alive. Now, what's it look like? Is it 2016, 40 to 10, where they annihilate you for four quarters? And your uh, former defensive coordinator calls it a bloodbath because Iowa actually hits in practice. Do you look just weak? Or do you put up a fight and guess what? They kick a field goal at the buzzer to break your heart again. I mean, it's got to look like a, a, you know, a 12 round fight. And if you fall, so be it. At least you played at a high level. Nebraska guys at least played at a high level on offense. Good enough on defense. Special teams was good when it came to three, right? Kickoff return with, with Barney. So you got all sorts of compliments going on, uh, different phases helping one another. So if I get that on Friday night as we're there uh, and, and they still fall, uh, it's it's understandable. Less understandable with a fourth string quarterback on the other side. Well, yeah, if, if if this Iowa team in its current iteration goes and puts up forty points on you, no, oh, oh boy. But yeah, here's, here's the way I kind of like a twenty-one to seventeen deal, and it's and it's 
and it's Caleb Johnson making a push for the Heisman. So he goes Ricky Williams on you, God forbid. Here, here's the way I kind of look at it. If uh, given the fact that Nebraska's at six, if there's a loss, there will be disappointment. If it's all, if it's it's you got to win to get to a bowl game, and you lose, whether it's thirteen ten in a last second field goal or you get blown out, it's devastation, and it is a long, long cold winter. But given what transpired on uh, on Saturday, the way I think about it is this. If Nebraska was to lose to Iowa on Friday, I would hearken back to the week when Steve Peterson got fired as Nebraska's athletic director and Nebraska hosted Texas A&M at Memorial Stadium. And Nebraska fought that game uphill the entire way. But for the most part, people in the stands were like, you know what? We're getting beat today, but we're over the four-year case of the flu and Tom's coming back. And there was just this kind of this air of, well, it was one of those few times at Memorial Stadium when Nebraska's losing, but everything was going to be okay because Tom's coming back and we're over the flu. So the way I look at it, this is kind of a one, uh, maybe a two-time thing. The first one being that in in that time, Mm -hmm. and this one, if Nebraska were to lose to Iowa, you know what? It's okay. We're going to a bowl game. We got to six, and this is that one time when we can be – you know, you fought hard, boys. Hopefully you fight hard. You don't get beat 56-7 to seven again. But you fight hard. You're going to a bowl game, probably a pretty good one. Sexy city in Nashville, down to Florida, Tampa. Probably not going to Detroit. Doubtful you're going to the Bronx, maybe to Phoenix. It's going to be a pretty good holiday. So I think there would be some forgiveness if Nebraska didn't pull it off. However... Two years ago, Nebraska goes on the road and beats Creighton in basketball. True. And then also the same year, go, Nebraska goes over and defeats Iowa at Iowa. So there, there's lots of trends, but that's people, the way I kind of view it. People trade forget. playing Friday. <laughs> well, is that guy wearing 17? Well, good question. Mm. Get him the ball. Keep feeding I, him, man. I mean, I, I think, uh, you, know, you know, like if the if the offense goes to Iowa City, and Iowa City, they're going to do exactly what you think they're going to do. They're going to run Caleb Johnson. They're going to run the ball. They're going to play action. They're going to play good defense, and they're going to have one special team moment. I I think it would be uh, a letdown if the offense goes over to Iowa City and really struggles. Like it just – it it doesn't – that's not going to score 44. It's not going to put up nearly 500 yards of offense. But just the vibe of the offense, if all of a sudden it looks clunky again, you go, Jesus, how bad is Wisconsin? Mm -hmm. I'd rather go – you know what? Playing a good defense, that offense still looks pretty good. You just got to execute. So it's kind of an interesting dynamic. But the vibe to watch that game or go to that game, even with 24 degrees at kickoff, is so much different after oh, 6 yeah. o'clock Saturday night. Yeah, no doubt. No, you, you had to have this this vibe, right? You needed to change, you need to change the music up, you know? And – Nebraska did. They got the win. There's some confidence. We we don't know. There's the portion of handling success that you've touched on, Sharpie. Yeah. Can Nebraska handle success? Uh, we'll see. But there's also the, oh, uh, that, that monkey is off their back where they don't have to worry about getting to six. There's, uh, as far as a stress level, there's inherent stress going on yeah. the road to end the season. But it's not do or die where if you – what Bill laid out, if you don't go and you don't get it done, then it's, you know, Siberia till spring football and there's no <laughs> no momentum. No. So, no, it's all right. I Just go play good football. Uh, let's see what Dana can bring. I'm fascinated by Parker versus Dana. I'm fascinated to see, okay, can the offensive line have a third straight game of where they've been good at, at, at pass blocking? Uh, 40 pass attempts, just four hurries against Wisconsin and a pretty good defense. So can they keep taking steps and can they remain balanced? Can we get more Emmett Johnson? Can we get more Dowdell in rhythm? I mean, I liked what I saw offensively and you saw a pretty confident freshman quarterback. I guess you nailed it. (laughs) (laughs) Those are are all things important. We will get to – 
uh, well, Thanksgiving drinking games. I, I have a list here. We'll get there. But it's just it's it's nice. interesting to value this game and not have it be make or break at the end of the season. Um, and I'm sure the the vibe around the team is different. I mean, you want to get to seven. You want to have that monkey off the backfield. But from a fan base point of view, like, hey, go in, be competitive. If it's a one-score loss late in the football game where Nebraska has some self-inflicted wounds, will there be some reaction? Absolutely. There will be some people calling into post-game shows. There will be some tweets flying around on Twitter, Facebook posts, however you consume your, your post-game content. If it's a one-score loss with self-inflicted wounds and Iowa goes out there and wins a football game because they get a late turnover and it's a walk-off in Iowa City, yeah, there will be some reaction. But you can always sit back and say, you know what? Nebraska got to six. It's okay. There's right. going to be one more game at the end of the year. Uh, but this is a game, realistically, I think Nebraska should be going out and winning. Um, when you talk about the want-to factor, I think you have more want-to factor on the Nebraska side just based on the recent history of this rivalry. I know you got one two years ago. I mean, what would that say if, if Nebraska goes and wins two straight in Iowa City? I think that would mean a lot. But the want-to factor is there for Nebraska. They're tired of being beat down by Iowa. And Matt Rule mentioned in his press conference on Monday all the Iowa fa- all the Iowa players – waving goodbye and saying, enjoy your Christmas this year, not going bowling again yep. after the game last year. I think that sticks in Nebraska's craw just a little bit. Uh, the seniors want to go out the right way. They want to get a win against Iowa. And you know what you saw last week what this team could be? Uh, I think you want to continue building on that because this team had high hopes coming into this season. I don't think it's been the season that they wanted. That losing streak sucked. And this is your chance to end the season on the on the right note and essentially – show your fan base and show the country, you know what, that five-game losing streak is, or sorry, the four-game losing streak is not who Nebraska is. This is who Nebraska is. Let's build some momentum going into the postseason. Let's go get a, a bowl victory. I, I think there's more want to on the Nebraska side. And that's why I say, you know what, with all the Iowa issues offensively, I know their defense is good. You have a revamped offense under Dana Holgerson. I'm not sure I'm prepared to anoint him as the savior of the Nebraska offense, but it's clearly better right now. Uh, I think you have the momentum on your side. I think you have the more want to on your side. You just got to go out and do it. But it should be a game Nebraska goes and wins. If they don't, though, Husker fans can sit back and say, you know what? We're still going to a bowl in a month. Yeah, and we don't know how they'll react. Like, you know, that that is hung over the program, especially if you're an older guy, that you haven't gone to a bowl game and you finally accomplished it. I mean, now can you just go out and play free and easy? I think the question is, you know, the defense is on this stretch of five straight games where they've given up at least six yards per play. And on the back end, they've struggled a little bit. It just, I still think they're a good defense. They're not elite, and they're dictated by who they're playing, which I think they wanted to avoid. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, it's just, uh, it, it, how, how will they play? You know, can, can the, the offense all of a sudden looks free? We think that'll be the same way on Friday night. And then Iowa will throw a wrinkle at them, and then how do they adjust? But can the defense play free? You know, they're going to be on a more physical type of game trying to stop a Caleb Johnson. I don't know. I, I Winning and getting to six, because guys have heard that for so long. They can recite the stats of what rules record is in November, what they have done when they've gotten on the cusp of it. Now they're there. Do they now just get, you know what, let's just go out and ball. Let's just go out and play football and, and let, let's see what happens. And then if that's the case, do we see the real Nebraska on Friday night for the first time this year? I mean, they got a chance well, to win eight games this year. Mm-hmm. which is kind of stunning, especially when you go back three weeks and see, as Elijah alluded to, what they've been mired in. And that was that four-game losing streak and the, the game at Indiana. And you, you fought well against uh, Ohio State and you played like, well, awfully in the first half against UCLA and dig it yourself too deep of a hole. But I, I think there's a legacy aspect to this, you know, that this, that this group of seniors led by Ty Robinson – who did what yeah, – appreciate him listening to the Average Joe Sports Show, did what we said he needed to do. That was be the leader on, on the field and in the locker room, and I think he really was kind of the star of the show. I know Emmett Johnson had a career day, and Dylan Raiola looked good. But I, I watched Ty Robinson throughout the day, and I just thought his, his emotion, his tenor, the way he played was the real leader on the field for Nebraska. So why not? Okay, we got to six. Mm-hmm. Let's go beat Iowa. Let's, let's, let's end with some momentum and not just one moment. So you end the season perhaps with a win at Iowa, and it's going to be on his defense to stop to stop uh, Caleb Johnson. No doubt about it. You, you're, I was not going to come out and throw the ball forty times like Nebraska. They're going to what they run last week like sixty sometimes or fifty seven. Fifty seven times. They're going to they do the same to. thing. Right. They're going to do the same thing on a nineteen degree night as it gets colder over there. 
Uh, so, yeah, it's going to be up to Nebraska's front seven to tackle, you know, with, with surety and maybe not to put so much pressure on what has been somewhat of a vulnerable secondary. So those guys have to make plays, too. The tackling has got to be great. But I think this is a legacy game. We've got to six. We're going bowling. We, we might as well go over, knock off Iowa, get a little bit of momentum, and you win your bowl game, and you've got an eight-win season after all of the ups and downs and dramas and the, the changes and Holgerson and all that. Uh, I think that there's a, a real possibility for Nebraska to end a season really, really strong that other teams really aren't, don't have that opportunity to do this year. The thing that to me is important, you've got some, some experience for Nebraska. You've got seniors that have come back in that back end. Okay. And I'm talking your safeties. This is a get back game for you. Do your job against the run but don't get beat over the top and make a fourth team quarterback look like he's all big 10. That's also been a trend, right? Elijah, what quarterbacks have done to you the last several weeks, throwing the football, some guys making their first start my Ava uh, specifically, right? He was rattled early, stabilized and, and was good enough throwing the football. Altmeyer, uh, Illinois had you off balance because they were able to run and throw the football, Indiana, did whatever they wanted to do and kept it going with a backup quarterback in the second half. If you're Nebraska, you got one job that is stop the run and make this guy uh, who's a distant relative of Eric Stratton. Damn glad to meet you. Uh, beat you with that right arm. Well, the, and the, the difference you, you though, can't you you can't go out and and have this guy torch. I mean, the difference between yeah. the this and the other teams that have run all over you, which you look at Indiana, you look at USC, it, those those teams can throw the ball on you. Um, and I, I don't mean to sit here and discredit Iowa's quarterback situation because he's still a Division One player. He's still a much better quarterback than I'll ever be. But the reality of Iowa's offense is, is they're pretty one-dimensional right now. Yeah, I think he was what seven of ten last week for less yep. than a hundred yards. Of, like, a lot of play action. Like, like they're going to have a couple throws for him in the game. But the reality of of the matter is, Nebraska can likely go eight in the box most of the game, if not nine, and feel comfortable that this is not the guy that is going to go air raid and beat you that way. Like, is he probably going to have a couple play action shots that hit? Yeah, probably. That's the reality of whenever you go eight or nine in the box. But that is so much less threatening to Nebraska than them handing the ball to Caleb Johnson 35 times and he puts up two bills. That's the concern in this football game. You, as a defense, have the ability this game to go stack your box, be prepared for that, and say, you know what? If Jackson Stratton, of all people, beats us, Jackson Stratton beats us, I guess. That's, that's the reality that you couldn't go pull out there against Indiana. You couldn't pull it out against USC. My concern is not what Nebraska's defense can do against Iowa's offense. My, my concern is it's squarely on the Huskers. It's do you get to six and kick your feet up and say, we've done it. We've accomplished what yeah. we wanted to accomplish. Awesome. We get to have a nice Thanksgiving week. We're going to enjoy our turkey on Thursday with the team, and then we're going to go out on Friday, and we're going to go play a football game, and who cares what happens. And that's being melodramatic, but – that's that's the concern here with Nebraska. It's not what Iowa does. It's it's how Nebraska responds uh, to to me. And I think why I have confidence in that regard this week is because of the proper button pushing that was done last week, specifically the offensive side of the ball with Dana Holgerson. But that was kind of our question at the end of last week: is it's, man, like Dana Holgerson really kicked some dudes in the tail last week, both publicly and I'm sure privately. He made it hard at practice. They were hard on that Husker offense all week long at practice. And the question was was are the Huskers mentally strong enough to be able to handle that at this point in the season based on what's happened? We saw the result. I mean, that offense put up its best performance of the Matt Rule era as complimentary football. You get to six. I have confidence that the button pushing will be right again this week. Because you as an experienced coach, and I'm looking at both Matt Rule and Dana Holgerson, you got to go push the right buttons this week and make sure your team doesn't have complacency issues because of the fact they got to six. But Dana's been around the block. Matt Rule's been around the block. I think they're going to push the right buttons this week and make sure this team is ready to play. Does that necessarily lead to a win? No, not necessarily. Iowa's defense is really good, and you know what? Caleb Johnson is also really good. But the game plan's in front of you. Iowa's not going to surprise you with anything on Friday night. It, it comes down to me, to Nebraska's preparation this week and their level of intensity on Friday after you got to bowl eligibility last week. When it and Does Nebraska have... Uh, a free rusher to, to get home. Uh, are your eyes where they're supposed to be from a coverage standpoint 
Are you doing your job or are you peaking? Or is it a 58 yard house call uh, from uh, your cousin Vinny again, right? When you, when you know they got to throw, um, can you um, can you be aware of the situation? Nebraska all season long has been pretty good at getting after the quarterback. They've had some or, or more banner games than other. They only had one sack against USC. They had uh, no sacks against Wisconsin. Part of that was USC's run game, but um, the, the few times Iowa will drop back or it'll be obvious passing situations, get someone home. That could be Ty or that could be Ty getting more attention. Someone else needs to, to step up on that defensive line. And do you have a junk defense? Do you, do you load the line with uh, uh, maybe a bare front if you are going up against a guy that has one star under his belt and they are afraid to let him drive the, the, the car? Yeah, I, I think another element of what you just laid out, Shemitty, is Nebraska's got to tackle. Mm. I mean, Caleb Johnson is having an incredible season. I mean, he's he's probably going to be either the third or fourth best player Nebraska has played all year. He's the best running back by far Nebraska's played. But of his nearly 1,500 ones. yards rushing, he's got over 1,000 of those are after contact. So Nebraska's going to have to tackle. And, and you know, it's going to be a physical game. It's going to be cold. Um, you know exactly what they're going to do. They're going to line up and say, hey, try and stop us. I also think this is this is probably for some help with Ty and Nash. This is Riley Van Poppel's game. Mm-hmm. You know, they've kind of saved him for 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 big, big guy football. Mm-hmm. They've saved that fourth game. That would be where he would be probably be inserted Friday night. So either to help or to, you know, give one of those guys a breather. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm all for for more Van Poppel. Tony White was asked about it as we tape on Tuesday about it today, and he's been off for a while, as Tony indicated. But, I mean, he's probably been part of this back pocket plan, don't you think, all yeah. along to save it? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, you know, you, you would you would be hurting yourself. I mean, we know that Riley Van Poppel is good, and he's the heir apparent. And if you got one more game to burn, this just seems like the right game. So, they probably had that conversation with him. They've ramped him up and said, hey, you know what? When we need you again, we needed you against Rutgers. When we need you again, it's going to be Iowa. You just got to do all the mental reps. He's working with the number two, so it's not like he's been on some backfield working with the scout right. team. And, you know, he's he's good enough that you can just insert to give, I don't know, 10, 15 snaps, which on Saturday or on Friday night might be enough to give the ability for Nash and Ty to play 35 to 40. Mm-hmm. Oh, they'll they'll empty the take for sure. We're talking Nebraska, Iowa, Black Friday. It's the Average Joe Sports Show. Bill Dolman, Gary Sharp, Elijah Herbal, Chris Schmidt. Uh, like and subscribe to the Average Joe Sports Show on YouTube. Tell a friend. Uh, search us on Spotify and iTunes. The Average Joe Sports Show. Leave us a review and uh, a rating. Appreciate that. The AJ Sports Pod, where you can find and follow on Twitter. What we've talked a lot about Nebraska's defense and tackling, and it was leaky. I think uh, 10 total missed tackles last week uh, against uh, a Wisconsin team that you didn't know what you were really going to get. You saw the effort against Oregon defensively, but they're still a shell of themselves offensively. They put up a point above their average, their season average. They put up, um, you know, uh, 20, um, 25 against you. They, they averaged about 23, 23 and a half. So, um, the, the big passing plays were, were kind of a surprise. 42-yarder and a 58-yarder and another 24-yarder. Uh, you're, you're so late in the season, man. Um, I, I don't know uh, if, if we should expect not giving up some busts in the secondary, but uh, that's that's got to be discouraging because you were better earlier in the back end uh, this season, I mean, look, 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 look at your effort against Colorado in that aerial assault. Now, fast forward to, to what UCLA did to you, uh, and uh, of course, uh, I mentioned USC. But even uh, with uh, with Locke, I mean, he got into a groove. Uh, he was able to find some some guys open. So there, but uh, guys got to know where they're supposed to be. That's a communication thing in the back end. Well, but don't you think that? Um... You know, now that Matt Rule has, you know, has come out and said, look, Tommy Hill's shut down. There was a lot of drama with that for so many weeks. And then given the performance at USC, there was, look, the, the misplays against USC, I think that permeated the game. And that was a downer. But now that you know, okay, look, 
we're not going to play that card anymore. Uh, this is who we have. We we believe in Sierra Wright. Bly Hill has come in. Bly Hill is the one who uh, jarred the ball loose at the end of the first half mm-hmm. and uh, enforced the turnover that led to a field goal. Uh, so good to have him back. But I think now that maybe you don't have that drama, whether that is was was a distraction uh, during the week and if there was something else going, I don't know. But the fact that you was – what Tommy Hill were you going to get if you were going to get him at all? No longer no longer an issue. So I think that helps a little bit to maybe give some certainty to the secondary as to what the rotations are. I think having yeah, they kind of settled on on Hartsaw being more safety than corner. Um, and, you know, look, this is late in the season to be doing all these things. But, you know, maybe there's been some very blunt conversations and saying this is this is our plan. And it's it's worked on in the tight end room, apparently, and in the running back room. So this is the way it is in the secondary. You make some plays, you execute, you stay out there, and you'll get a chance to play. So I think that helps the secondary a little bit. I think it also helps the secondary that you're playing Iowa this week. And that's I, I oh, keep yeah. on being down the Iowa offense. Do you guys know how many Iowa receivers this year have a total of 100 yards? Have they had a 100-yard receiver? Yeah. There's three uh, of them. Three one is one of them the tight end, Luke Lachey. I, I'm not counting tight ends, just okay, wide okay. receivers. Just wide receivers, they have three. Uh, Jacob Gill's got 365 receiving yards on the season, good for 33 a game. Uh, you have Reese Van Der Zee with 176 receiving yards on the season, good for 22 a game. And then you have Seth Anderson with 106 yards on the season, good for 17 a game. Those are the guys that's going to be hurting, are going to be testing your secondary. I will say it's a big game for the linebackers and for Isaac Gifford. Those are guys that are going to have the tight ends, and, and that's where you're a little bit better. Uh, Luke Lachey's got 218 receiving yards on the season, good for 21 a game. And then you also have their backup tight end who's gotten a lot of work this year. Lachey's been a little banged up, and they're kind of a two tight end team anyway. He's got 125 receiving yards on this season, good for 11 a game. So uh, none of those guys scare you based on the box score and based on what my eye test has told me about Iowa football this year. Where it can get dangerous is whenever Iowa's got that downhill rushing attack going and then you leak out the tight end on play action and now you have to have your your linebackers and and your rover Gifford with a really, really good eye discipline. That could maybe stress you, but it's a get-right game for the secondary. At least cross your fingers because Mm -hmm. none of those guys really threaten you. So basically it's 1980s Nebraska's offense after the scoring explosion where you're looking for Godowski and uh, Keith McCant to hit a wide receiver maybe six times a game. Well, I mean, John Bostick was white lightning. <laughs> uh, and don't forget old Johnny Mitchell, uh, you know, uh, somehow well, being uncovered. <laughs> I, I think, uh, you know, what Elijah just rattled off, and we're talking about the defensive backs, who that's going to be a deeper dive when the season is over on what exactly happened there and what does the future with John Butler look like incorporating – his defensive backs into this defense is I think the Nebraska's linebackers are going to have to play well. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you look at that Maryland game and, and I've been impressed by Tim Lester. That was a really good hire by Kirk Ferentz. You know, his son gets fired and he has to find somebody that is new in a, in a program that has a ton of stability with his coaching staff. I thought he made a really good hire. Their points are up. Their yards are up. You consider the injuries that they've had. They've still been able to score. They're running the ball for over 200 yards, albeit a lot of it's with Caleb Johnson. I think when they want to throw, you know, they're going to play, they're going to do that play action. I think Nebraska's linebackers are probably going to have to be the best unit on the field yep. on Saturday because not only in the play action, but, or on Friday, excuse me, not only in the play action, but think about if, if Caleb Johnson gets through that first level. I mean, those guys are going to have to have to stop him before he makes a house call. And he's a guy that maybe is starting to wear down. His longest run in November is 16 yards. Yeah, he's he's logged the miles for sure, for sure uh, with it. Two hundred and twenty-three rushing attempts on the season. Uh, I mean, that's in this day and age, even you know, college compared to the NFL, where they're having a little bit of a running back renaissance. That's still a lot, but but that just shows you how good he is to put up those kind of numbers when they essentially don't have a passing game. No, it's uh, it's been a better offensive line for Iowa. You know, we we pick teams to to look out for at the beginning of the season and, and I was one I had circled. I thought it would be uh, uh, the, the kid from Michigan. I get uh, 
Kate McNamara. McNamara, Will, right. Yeah. His uh, jerseys are on sale in Iowa City for 99 <laughs> cents, apparently, because uh, he took his ball and took off. But, man, Sullivan, before he got hurt, what that running element really uh, helped uh, this offense look good at times, just really dynamic with his mobility with, with Caleb and then the passing game. I want to flip it over, guys, and, and talk a little bit here about uh, Dana Holgerson. And, you mean uh, DGAF? Kind of, yeah, right? <laughs> he, uh, he had another media session this week and answered some questions. You know, was asked about Emmett Johnson, really complimented the offensive line again, uh, and, and then kind of got into the tight ends part of thing because that was a, a, a thing last week where you had three catches, 27 yards, and it was Borkature and Lindenmeyer, and you had three snaps from Fedoni. And he hinted that, you know, Thomas has responded the right way and maybe look for him to be a little more involved this Black Friday. But I just like – I like Dana's approach. We aren't quite sure what the future holds because he wasn't ready to go there today when he spoke with the media. He's just worried about Black Friday and getting Saturday off, and then things will uh, move how they're going to move. But uh, what a what a job he has done. But more so just the demand he has made and, and then the result he's gotten at least through one game from week one to week two. Hey, do you guys find it interesting? Stuff he has said, which there's been a lot of truth-telling. and I mean, I, I think if you're Matt Rule, you're a little uncomfortable because there's some things that Dana has said that you're like, why was that going on? How come that wasn't addressed oh, uh, earlier? But, super telling. But can you imagine Marcus Satterfield? Oh. I, we've never seen this before where a guy comes off the street, basically shoves you aside, and is in a not-so-subtle way ripping everything that you have done, and you're <laughs> still on the staff. I mean, that's wild. I mean, his stuff today about the playbook, but it's also wild that, that the average Joe Sports Show and Hale Varsity – and my show, we've been saying this stuff all season long. And it's continued to be allowed. And then it took a guy, the bad cop, to come in. And all of a sudden, things are different. And the guy that was here is still here. And he's getting absolutely torched by a guy that he has to share a room with. It, it, that, that is the bizarro world of Nebraska <laughs> football. So it kind of comes down to the, the boss knowing that things need to need to change, things needed to be fixed. But as the boss, I'm going to bring in and bring in somebody to to delegate that change. Versus myself, I mean, he 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 he. It was his order, but mm-hmm. yet it wasn't his hit, so to speak. Right. Um, so I'm glad the change was made from a. Hey, you've got some sort of semblance of an offense. You've got some sort of semblance of complimentary football through at least last week against Wisconsin, right? Uh, But at least you could not exist the way you were existing. You were going to lose out, and it was going to be chaos this offseason. The equity you've built up, the the, the confidence through your words, and people like what you do from a development standpoint – and they also like your fervor for recruiting, right? They, they, you're, you're doing a lot of good things. You just need to win on the field. And he said he wants his best football at the end of the year. Well, what he had hired on the offensive staff, bless his heart, trying to bring guys along, wasn't getting it done, and it was holding his football team back. He had to make a change, and it is super weird. You got to be professional. You're still getting a check. And um, you're part of a team, right? You preach that to these 18 to 22 year olds. You better live it as a coach. You know, to a certain extent, this is uh, this is a developmental football program, uh, and always has been for players. You know, that Nebraska's program is was built uh, on the development of walk-ons to enhance the roster in ways that other programs around the country could not do, and really maybe not did not have to do. But Nebraska had to develop. They did it through that four- and five-year plan of redshirting way back, JV football and all that. But in this day and age, when you have corporations that are football programs now, and as seriously as Nebraska takes it, 
this is not really a place that should be a developmental coaching operation. Um, it, it, given the given the pro, the project in front of Matt Rule and company, and Trev Alberts at the time, and now Troy Dannon, um, maybe if Nebraska is chugging along at 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 winning nine games a year, ten games a year, like like Tom Osmer was doing, and a, and a position comes open, and you hire a young assistant coach out of Brown named Ron Brown, who's in his late twenties or early thirties when he gets the job, and you can develop him along. But Nebraska's at, at the stage this program was at when Matt Rule took over, you needed to bring in coaches that were ready to coach on day one and not start developing your staff or giving favors to friends. And, you know, the Garrett McGuire hire was intriguing. There's no question he knows the game. He's got a great football lineage and, and has a wonderful career ahead of him. But to be the head coach, at, uh, the, the receivers coach at Nebraska at this time when the, when the program needs – an overhaul and to be, you know, to be brought, brought along in this era of college football, that was, that was a real risk. And Marcus Satterfield, when you take a look at the resume, wonderful guy, by all accounts, a very nice man and uh, very loyal to Matt rule, but the resume does not belie, you know, great successes over a long, over a long career or anything innovative. And, uh, you know, Donovan Raiola, I think, has established himself with his offensive line in Nebraska. Mm -hmm. So I understand why he stayed and not because he's the uncle of a kid who was going to be a five star. But this is a program that needs established coaches in this era to get Nebraska to where Matt Rule and this wants it to be and where this state deserves it to be. And bringing in Dana Holgerson with, you know, some uh, with his maturity, shall we say, and his bluntness. Um, you know, I was, it was a shrewd move and one that I think Matt rule understood that he had to make because it wasn't just being a football coach in Nebraska. It was being a football coach for Nebraska. And he understands now after two years on the job that this place understands what's going on inside those four walls and credit to, credit for making that, making the change. I, I was intrigued by what Dana Holgerson said at his press conference, um, you know, that it was uncomfortable in their meetings. And I'm sure he probably sugarcoated it just a little bit. And there's some butthurt feelings probably as to this guy coming in here and doing what he's doing and talking about how big the playbook is. And we just need one sheet, you know, and if you don't execute, you don't play and all those kinds of things. Well, you know, the tree needed to get shaken up and he did it. And I think for two weeks, Nebraska's had a great rhythm offensively. And I'm sure that's probably caused Iowa to maybe go back and start looking at some old Houston and maybe West Virginia game film, mm. you know, to see some things that, you know, that Dana Holgerson has done because you probably burn some of the game film from earlier this, this season from Nebraska, because it's been a, a very different team the last two weeks. You know, here's how I am, imagine that first week was, Hey guys, you know, Dana, Hey guys. <laughs> why are you why are you doing this this way? Why are there four million pages, exaggeration, hopefully, in the playbook? Why are you asking guys to go do this? Is it because it, it's what you want to do or you what you what you know they can do? He laid it out perfectly with his presser today. It's a one sheet, it's a mini menu. Guess what? We're great with making wings and our pizza's killer. <laughs> what more do you need? <laughs> Burgers pretty solid as well. All right. I so think you're going to give a little you, you, uh, little bump to some place now. Well, I'm just. I'm <laughs> a, what, 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 what place in Lincoln would that be? I don't know. I don't know. I got uh, one in mind, but they can pay up for that. <laughs> yes, exactly. Right about there on the uh, the old screen, um, but. No, he needed to come in and ask those questions. He did, and then and he moved. Been... Then he moved the chairs. Yes, I mean, I it's refined. He's in charge of everything about the offense, except for the offensive line. Mm -hmm. He there's there's you can tell the difference that he's in charge of running back, wide receiver, and tight end rotation. And and that's how it should be as offensive coordinator. Yeah. But that's where, you get, that's where you get paid. But I think there were a lot of guys that just followed along with Matt Rule said because they've worked with him and that's how they've done it. And then as you were alluding to Schmitty and, and Elijah and Bill have, have definitely touched on numerous times, you brought in a guy that 
you know, you, you gave him the keys to the car and you said, here you go. You can, you, you take control of the room. You're the play caller. You find guys that fit what you want. And then the next step, Dana, if you're going to hang around here and we'd like you to hang around here, you get to decide who's going to work with you in the future. And you're also going to help us decide who we need to go after to be productive in your offense and who we need to say, you're not one of the 105 or you're one of the 105. We want you to stay here. 100% agree. And, and, and you know what? And that's a, the, the, there's going to be the another, another part. And, and, you know, Saturday was nice, but I don't think it's like, okay, it's a referendum and now Nebraska's fixed and here we go. And it's going to be cool. And man, 25, we're going to be in the playoff. And on this Tuesday night next year, we're going to be watching to the playoff rankings. Now that'd be ideal, but, you know, I, I think moving forward with Matt Rule into year three, he's got right now two coordinators that are head coaches, one that's been a head coach and the other that aspires to be a head coach. Year three needs to be the year where Matt Rule becomes the CEO. You know, there are fewer and fewer head coaches that are absolute hands on. They kind of oversee the program. They know exactly what's going on. They chime in here or there, but they make good hires. You have to in year three no micromanaging, no hanging out on one side of the ball and ignoring the other. Be in charge of the whole program and let guys cook on both sides and see what the result is because look what it's done to offense. Maybe on defense where Rule, that's his strength and he hangs out a little bit more, and I think he's he's been more with the defense than he was last year. Mm-hmm. We'll see what the result is. But I, I watch that in the offseason if that's, if that's a transition for Rule. Well, Gary, is that, is that assuming Tony White sticks around or is that no matter who's at defensive coordinator? Well, I think that's who it is, uh, whoever it is, because if Tony White is not here next year, you're going to have to make that hire either internally or outside. And even more so internally, you have to walk away from, I know everything about that person and how they operate and just let them do their job. And I don't, you know, and I don't think Rule is a major micromanager, but he does have his pulse on the program. And I think being an overseer instead of just a defensive guy you won't have the problems again that we had in offense where he let offense slip to the mm-hmm. point of, geez, we got to get a guy off the streets, off his couch to come in here and in a short amount, of, short amount of time fix it. And then we can go, damn, man, that was that was not good. Now we have to rethink. Guys are being discovered. I mean, for, for God's sake, Saturday against Wisconsin, IGC was on the field as a wide receiver. Remember, we were all kind of under the impression that because of his injury, he can't go and play wide receiver, but yet he can be a punt returner. That's the guy that Rule saw along with Quinn Clark and said, why isn't that guy playing? He's running routes. He's He looks the part. Why isn't he playing? I mean, isn't that crazy? It, it's, it's, Isaiah Garcia it, Castaneda was playing wide receiver in the 11th game of the season when that's been his position and they've just relegated him to being a punt returner. For mm-hmm. six years, it's been his position. <laughs> I mean, it was his position in Ireland, for, for God's sake. You owe it to yourself to have a killer staff, guys that will challenge you, guys that will make you better as a head coach, but above all, guys that can go do their job on their side of the ball for their position group and, and coordinate it. You're, you are going to be playing crazy tough chess week in, week out in this league. Uh, give yourself the advantage of having uh, someone that can, you know, match swords. Well, and, I, and he, don't kid yourself. If you have openings on your staff, working for Dana Holgerson is much more appealing than working for Marcus Satterfield. Well, and, and there, there you hit the th- $7 million point of all of this. It's not that guys – didn't want to work with rule or didn't probably take a phone call. I would bet money that that was the major pause. Why was Dana not here? Yeah. He needed a little time. I get it, but Dana wants to be in control. Mm-hmm. Same with Pete's, right? Why was he, you know, waffling a little bit between NFL and, and, and coming back to Nebraska. The co-coordinator thing is okay for some, but not all. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's just the truth of it. Don't you think that one of the big, um, uh, I don't want to say points of contention, that's not the right word, but one of the one of the big issues as to whether or not Dana Holgerson comes back is if he does get uh, complete autonomy as to who he will work with. 
you know, uh, that, that he can make the changes he wants to make. He's not just the offensive coordinator. As I said, I think last week, he is the offensive coach. Mm-hmm. You've got that side of the ball. Mm-hmm. Who do you want? We are pretty happy with our offensive line coach, and so is the quarterback. But mm-hmm. I think I think Donovan Rayola has accorded himself really, really, really well over the top over the time that he's been here. And they've, they've got let his guys do the, the job. Play. They've right. they've, they've, they've let his yeah. guys run block. Right. And and, and look, and, and if you're Dana Holgerson, you know, and and what you want to do offensively is is pretty much predicated on skilled position players anyway. You let offensive line coaches live in their own world with their own players. You tell them where you want them to go. And that's 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 just it. But I would have I would imagine that this this dance that we're doing right now as to whether he's going to come back, whether or he's not, or he's going to go do something else, that conversation is going to be uh, he, Gary, as you said, uh, I want my guys working with me on that side of the ball. And look, he's probably going to say, I'd like to be a head coach again someday. And I, I think if you're Dana Holgerson, just like Chip Kelly, you take a couple of years off, you wait for NIL and transfer portal, settle down, figure out what the rules are, and wait for the right job to open up. There is one job, and I don't think it's going to open, but if it's going to give people a little fear right now is if Mike Gundy rides off into the sunset from the Cowboys. And I, 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 have a, I don't think he will go away with his team having won three and lost eight and finishing in the basement of the Big 12. I can't see Gundy quitting like that, and I can't see Oklahoma State ever forcing him out. But I would think that that would be one job where Dana Holgerson would be a perfect fit to get back into the head coaching ranks. And that might happen in, uh, you know, two, three years, four years, something like that. And once you get through this uh, cycle with Nebraska – uh, and you t- you're ready to get back in in your late fifties. I think that's what happens. But I think I think his decision to stay here is to see how much control and if it's total control over the offense that Matt Rule is willing to give up. Would it surprise any of you if he also got calls to be an OC somewhere else? I think the NFL, uh, depending on his contacts there, because I mean that's something you got to consider too. I think that's something that might be appealing to him. He's having fun calling games and working with quarterbacks and just designing offense. I think that's what's so appealing right now is you don't have all the BS that Bill talked about as head coach right now. Just let me go call ball games and talk to recruits you bring in. <laughs> yeah, but he's, making four million, he's making $4 million no matter what. He, yeah. he, he is. Um, I, I mean, you know, I, I think he's he's saying all the right thing, like he said today, about just focusing on getting through this game, and then there's a bowl game. But I think it's important, you know. I, I think there's going to be after Friday, guys. I think I think there's going to be a lot of moving pieces because mm-hmm. you got to act quickly. You got December fourth coming up, and then you got December 9th. And if this is the offense that Nebraska is showing, the guy that's orchestrating it needs to be a commitment that he's here. And that you yeah. could sell that to recruits. So I would expect post Iowa a lot of a lot of personnel things to go on to get Nebraska set up where they're set up for the bowl preparation, but they're also set up for any any potential flips at the last moment or who they're going to pursue in the portal. Because I think you know, like I, I said earlier, I think if Dana's here, he goes, okay, I need that guy, that guy, that guy. Hey. This is a guy that we could put together a package for NIL. Are you interested in him? And he looks at the film and he says, oh, yeah, that guy could fit here in our offense. Mm-hmm. I think I think there's a, I think the next – the week between Nebraska's last game and the official announcement of where they're going in a bowl game, going to be pretty interesting around here. I think that will be the next phase of, okay, I see what Matt Rule's doing. And I think Dana knows – what the current setup of college football is. He's not dumb. Mm -hmm. Like he knows the importance of having the personnel locked up, having the guys ready to go. He knows the implication of taking the OC job nine games into the season. He understands what that means. Like, I don't think Dana, Dana has plans to go anywhere. It's just if some opportunity that he wasn't expecting opens up and he can't say no, that's what concerns you with Dana. If I had to put like a, a, a pulse on it now, like, probably 80% chance Dana's still around next year. It's probably where I'd put it next year because you you don't make that move knowing the implication of what college football is right now in terms of the, the crunch after the season. You don't make that move 
unless you have some thoughts that, you know what, this would be a place that I could see myself sticking around for a while. It's just if the unexpected offer comes along, that's when you get worried. You've got leverage right now to get paid, and I know you're getting supplemented by Houston, but uh, you still got to play a little hard to get. You've come in to help save the offense. You got them to six, maybe seven, maybe more. But uh, to, to leave as quickly as you came in would, would hurt because they're, I think they're on the doorstep with him in place if they have him in place uh, on, on Monday of, of next week, right before signing day, Wednesday, and then portal season. Uh, that, that is, that, that's huge. I think that's, that's got to be the chat Sunday morning, whatever happens on Black Friday. And, you know, he, he, maybe he's got somebody in mind if he's not going to stick around. Maybe he's got somebody in mind that would be, a, the, you know, the protege that, you know, Matt Rule ought to take a look at that could, you know, that would be interested in taking over this job. I mean, that's a possibility, too. But I think you're right. He doesn't have to. He doesn't have to be like Butch Jones, you know, who goes, what, from Alabama to Tennessee, fails spectacularly. And, you know, what's to say a head coach and now he's at Arkansas State, you know kind of floundering around. I, Dana Holgerson can afford to take a little time off and figure it out. But you're right, Gary, the, the, the timeline here with it, it is so strange to think that you've got championship games taking place the first week of December, then the portal opens up. Who's going to, who's going to be around on some of those bowl teams? You know, Nebraska is going to be without a lot of players probably, you know, who are excited to be going that Nebraska is going to a, a bowl. They're just not going because they're, yeah. they're in the portal, and whoever Nebraska is going to take on is probably going to yeah. have a lot of players well, walking around either. No, I, and that's a great point, Bill. But I think in Nebraska is going to be very fortunate. Like, let's say, let's just let's just hypothetically say they're playing Ole Miss in the Music City Bowl. You might have quite a few of top opt outs from Ole Miss. You maybe will have three opt outs of the regulars for Nebraska. I mean, I, that would be the max. I don't know. You know, I'm going to count Tommy Hill in there. Um, but most everybody is going to opt in to play in the bowl game. So that's a benefit for, for uh, Nebraska. I just think with Dana, and, and I agree with uh, the percentage that Elijah put on it, his stock in two weeks has started to rise, and his name is back out there. And because of the athletic revenue sharing, colleges can't afford to fire coaches, but boy, they can afford the coordinator move, and they can also afford to pay – 1.6, 1.8 for a coordinator instead of $46 million for a head coach buyout. Yeah, and and you're going to see those coordinator salaries keep going up arrow, fellas, right? So you're saying the other Oklahoma. Well, I mean, that's a, you know, Oklahoma's going to have an open job. They have a lot of money. Um, you, you make enough money at Oklahoma that you can spend $94 at Taco Bell, so life is good <laughs> in Norman. It just, we we don't know... And it's probably, you know, I mean, we're focused on getting the season over, but we don't know probably what Dana wants. You know, we say, man, I think he wants to be a head coach, take some time off. We can tell that just calling ball, he's enjoying. Mm -hmm. But, like, what does the path he sees at a, at 53 years old to not get so far out of the game that you get forgotten? But if you do well in Nebraska, you're always at the forefront. But does he use the three weeks to go, hey, I'm back? Sure. Does it recharge him uh, to, to go lead a program? Uh, the thing that I'm interested in, though, is, uh, I mean, he's quite comfortable with Rule, clearly. Yeah. A ton of respect. And Rule's going to leave him alone. That's the other thing. You take a job uh, just to be back as the, the boss uh, and, and, and have it go sour again. The, the stress part of it, the NIL part of it, the recruiting part of it, all the logistics you got to deal with as a head man uh go get go get filthy rich and just draw up stuff on a napkin man <laughs> I, mean, I, was, I i think what something you said schmitty about his respect for rule he he's not going to comment on the future with a game to go that was a very professional dana holgerson answer today the question was appropriate i thought the answer was you i'm going to answer this but you guys know what i'm saying Let's, mm -hmm. let's talk about this next week, and then maybe we'll have something. Yeah. And what jobs, again, what jobs are going to be open? This the, when, when Florida decided that Arkansas, Billy Napier, I, I, I don't know. Uh, they love Sam Pittman down there. I, I probably, like him too, but. But, um, but, real, but seriously, when, when Florida decided to stick with 
Billy Napier. That was like the, the card that everybody was waiting to be thrown, and then they put it back in their hand. And I, right now there's not a lot of speculation out about major jobs other than, like I mentioned, there's there's some talk about Gundy, but Gundy's saying, I'm not leaving now. He's two that, years removed that, from 12 and two. Right. That's the kind of job that, that you would see Dana Holgerson taking. He's not, let's say PJ Fleck leaves Minnesota. He's not going to, you no. know, this guy's not going to go from, you know, living in Texas. Yeah. He's going to yeah. put up with 16 degrees in Iowa city on a Friday. He's not going to put up with 16 degrees every day in Minneapolis. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's gotta be. The I, right I, fit. I don't think there's a head coaching job out there, but uh, you're right. You keep an eye on an OC job yeah, because, right. and you know, if, if you reach out to Dana's agent, and they say they're interested, and you look and you say, "Well, we already have an OC, but we're we're kind of on the fence about him." But Dana's interested in our job. You know how that works. We have all dealt in that world. And the next thing you know, a domino falls. But I think the fact that he said he's happy here, his relationship with Rule, Dylan Raiola is at a quarterback position. He's been given full autonomy. I think will go in a way of Nebraska locking him up. But they have to. I mean, that would be that'd be a gut punch if in the next two weeks, Matt Rule has to put, you know, has to go on Indeed.com and find an offensive coordinator <laughs> because there's certainly there's certainly no one on staff. No. Even Glenn Thomas, I would not go there. And you're going to have some moving pieces of some assistants whose contracts are up. Mm-hmm. But, Gary also, Sharp. Real, real quick about the assistants, too. If there are some personnel changes with Nebraska, as we know, this is a staff of about 50. So they have plenty of people that should some move on during bowl preparations. There are analysts and, you know, mid fifties GAs or whatever they, whatever the classification is these days, there are plenty of people on staff that could fill the hole for bowl preparations who are accomplished coaches in their own right. So Nebraska would not be going in there, you know, a couple of people shy who wouldn't know how to execute a game plan for a day. Well, let's get predictions in and uh, we'll get you ready for black Friday with the average Joe sports show. Elijah, you want to jump into the pool here first? Yeah. I think Nebraska's offense is not Wisconsin level. Good. I think it's better. I think they take a lead. Iowa's offense is not good playing from behind. I think it's a game that feels closer than the final score, but Nebraska gets it done 28 to 13. Okay, 28, 13 says Elijah. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit. Uh, that would of, be that'd be overs, by the way, just barely. Yeah, no, I get it. I'm going to go. <laughs> I'm going to go poetic justice, uh, and uh, that is Nebraska hits a walk off field goal to win <laughs> against Iowa. Give hey. me John Hole. Give me Nebraska 24-21. I mean, John Hole had more field goals than Ryan Kalkbrenner this weekend. <laughs> uh-huh. um, <laughs> We remind our dear friend Jeff Motes of that uh, about every three minutes. <laughs> I uh, I worry about Nebraska's run defense and the fact that the defense has not been as strong. I, I think it's going to be, what, 19 degrees of kickoff. Um, it's big boy football. Riola has not played in weather like this. I don't think Nebraska is going to all of a sudden be, you know, Air Coriel. They're going to have a smart game plan for the conditions and the defense they're going to face. I think for the seventh straight year, this is a one-score game. But in this case, I think Iowa wins 24-20. Oh. But let's give some love to John Hole because that would be two more John Hole field goals. Has John Hole taken over the starting place kicker job Absolutely. for next year? Absolutely. I hope so, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. There's no question in my mind. Absolutely. Guys, nine of thirteen, and he's hit seven straight. We've jinxed the poor, the poor bastard. <laughs> <Right. laughs> I'm, uh, Take I'm, it gonna, home. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a bold prediction and say that the best running back named Johnson on the field on Friday is Emmett and not Caleb. I'm gonna say that uh, Emmett Johnson outgains Caleb. Just to see what happens, okay? Because if it happens, I look like a friggin' genius. Uh, <laughs> but I like Emmett, and I've loved Emmett for two years. I loved what he does out of the backfield. I don't think Iowa has that kind of uh, pass catching and uh, running back combo going right now the way uh, Emmett is. I think Nebraska wins it. Uh, I'm going to say 17-17. Uh, 
10. Okay, 17-10. Everyone, happy Thanksgiving. We'll That's check three field with- goals and a touchdown with a two-point conversion. <laughs> Go for two. Roll it right. Everyone have a great Thanksgiving. We'll be back at you Sunday live at 1030 for the Average Joe Sunday live pod. Uh, gobble, gobble, and uh, get that wild turkey. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>